At Baker's, shopping with pickup and delivery is the same as shopping in-store. Same low prices, deals, and rewards on the same high-quality items. It's one small click for groceries, one big win for busy families everywhere. Start your cart today at bakersplus.com. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Save big on your favorites with the buy five or more, save a dollar each sale. Simply buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with your card. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Previously on the ISFET Archives. It appears that she hasn't gone too far from the city. She's only a couple hours away in Wisconsin. I am currently tracing the GPS on her smartphone. And who are Hastings in September? They're my friends. No, Emily. They're not. They are the real monsters. This is why I'm telling you that we must eliminate them. We can vet Marcus first, but we need to be prepared for the fact that he is likely another anomaly. Emily will not be okay with us murdering Marcus. Her. Harp. Do you trust her? Oh, no, Marcus. I do not. Hastings, what does your gut tell you? Not just your head, but your actual instincts. Okay, September. Let's do it your way. Let's rescue Emily and Marcus. Contractor Hop. Please do not contact the main office or initiate a TCO cleaning supplies facility tour until negotiations are complete. Well, Hastings in September. Looks like tonight's the end of the road for you. Eastfed Archives has adult language and violence and is not suitable for children. Listener discretion is advised. Isfet Archives is a creative typo entertainment production. If you enjoy this show, we invite you to support us on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash creative typo. All levels of membership include ad-free listening, and our binge tier includes access to this complete season. Thank you for listening. Chapter 9. The Isfet Observation 4. From the Isfet Archives The tap refers to the moment an anomaly first gains access to the Isfet. Although anomalies are not classified as human, a chronicler is not to take the life of a targeted anomaly until the powers begin to manifest. Any guide that breaks this protocol should also be reported back to the Casa dos Guia. Hastings stopped the black sports utility vehicle in front of a modern-looking cabin. He could have parked the vehicle a short span away, allowing him to approach under cover of darkness. He and September could have quietly infiltrated the cabin in an attempt to save Emily and Marcus. This would have been the most logical, and not to mention his preferred method of handling such situations. But September had convinced him to attempt negotiations with the harp first. 
In Chronicler Annals, the records collected by his people that contained the history of the Earth to the extent of Chronicler knowledge, Hastings had never found a single example of a successful negotiation between the Contra organization and any of the hidden. As far as he could tell, the Contra trained all of their operatives to hate anything that they classified as inhuman. Humanity's ability to discriminate against anything that they believed might threaten their place of power in the world was as predictable as it was priggish. Humanity, in general, had no idea how much effort was spent by the hidden in order to keep their society from perpetual disaster. The few humans that appeared to have any insight into the matter spent much of their time hunting the exact same hidden that protected them, deeming them aberrations that posed a critical threat to the human race. Hastings glanced over to September. September always knew exactly what humans were feeling, and he could always determine the right words to say. To Hastings, however, humans made very little sense. They simply kept doing the same things over and over, year after year, generation by generation, with little to no regard for the people, wildlife, or nature around them. It was exhausting to watch. Maybe this is why Hastings had worked so hard with September to devise a plan to help the anomalies. He considered the possibility that his feelings of resentment may have stemmed from centuries of protecting a human race that would most certainly kill Hastings long before thanking him for services rendered. It may have been the fact that while humans advance in knowledge and technology, their hunger for control, power, and violence did not subside. It may have simply been that there was not enough information about anomalies in the Chronicler Annals. Whatever the reason, Hastings had decided to divert his efforts away from the human race and to the anomalies, a race that might actually deserve to be saved. To his knowledge, he was the only Chronicler in all history that had chosen this path. September had his own reasons for wanting to save Emily. The guide had tried to explain those reasons to Hastings on several different occasions. But they were driven by moral ambitions, something Hastings rarely gave much thought. In his opinion, it didn't matter what ideals drove September. He trusted his friend and would follow his advice. That was enough. So they sat in the driveway of a cabin owned by an organization full of people that had kidnapped their friend and wanted to murder him. The goal was to speak to a trained assassin in an attempt to save two anomalies, which they should, by all rights, have killed months ago. September gave Hastings a weak smile and then opened the car door. This was not going to end well. Emily? Are you in there? Emily watched in disbelief as Hart pulled the trigger and a bullet struck September in the chest. Her friend fell back against the side of the SUV and a second shot went off. September fell to the ground. September! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Who are you shooting at? We are not here to fight! The ones that want to hurt you. You killed him! No, I hit him in the chest once and the shoulder once. It takes a lot more to kill an inhuman. He said they didn't want to fight. They lie. No, no, Hastings can't lie. You're full of shit. Just stay where you are and be quiet. This is the only way I can protect you. Emily, are you okay? Can you hear me? Stop! I said shut up and stay still! With practiced efficiency, Harp detached the rifle from the stand and repositioned herself away from the window. Emily noted that Harp had moved the television set earlier for this exact reason. She had anticipated this altercation and had moved the television to a place where she could take cover while having a direct line of sight on the cabin door. This would certainly be a point-blank shot should Hastings decide to enter through that doorway. Then, the blue lines came. Two of them, faintly at first, began to connect her to Harp and Marcus. The blue lines pulled energy toward her, more slowly this time. She felt the push and pull of the lines as the energy trickled from Harp and Marcus and into her chest. From her last dream, she now understood the method in which she could push the blue out into others. Knowing this, she was able to control the speed with which the blue could flow. She also felt the reservoir in her chest and quickly looked down to find the flow of blue energy was draining from her chest 
and pooling on the floor below her feet. With a small effort, she sealed her reservoir and began containing the blue energy called Isfit. Holding even just a small amount of Isfit, the sensations Emily experienced were at first overwhelming and intoxicating. Though she knew the danger of her current predicament, Emily couldn't help but feel overcome with instant bliss. Warmth radiated from her chest. Her senses enhanced, enabling her to better hear, see, and smell the environment around her. She had complete control of her ispit and could sense the flow of energy as if a string was pulling and pushing at her chest. She felt full of what she could only describe as life itself. With a sense of calm knowing, Emily began to burn the Isfet that she had stored in her reservoir. This was not something she had learned from her dreams. But in her awakened state, she felt that it was the right thing to do. Two more lines lit up immediately. An orange line and a green line simultaneously appeared and shot through the front wall of the cabin. These lines she assumed connected to Hastings and September. With an effort, Emily attempted to push and pull at these new lines, but they did not react the same way the blue lines had. Then the world lit up around her. A dim and beautiful pink aura allowed her to see all the plant life around the cabin. Sharp points of red identified the animal wildlife that hastily retreated further into the wood line, apparently spooked by the gunfire. The gunfire. The memory pulled Emily back to her senses. She shook from her reverie and brought her mind back to the situation at hand. She stopped pulling the blue from Marcus and in turn pushed some of the energy back toward the Harbinger. This made sense now. Marcus would need that energy. Emily, do you see that? The lines? Yeah, I can see them. No, no lines. The room is warping though. Everything is twisted. There are eyes watching and flowers dying. The walls are angry and the moon is looking away. Marcus, I... I don't know what that means. Are, are you okay? It's happening again. Like the bank. But... but different. I can see you twisting it. You're twisting the starlight. Am I hurting you? No. You're not hurting me. You don't have to stop. Can you see the lines? No, but I know you're doing something. I can feel you... expanding. Shut up! The both of you! Marcus, we need to focus. We can't let Harp kill Hastings. I'm not certain what Hastings and September are trying to accomplish, but... If Hastings says that they're not here to fight, he's telling the truth. I know it might sound strange, but... He can't lie. It's not possible. What do you want me to do? I don't know. But we need to stop Harp. Okay. Outside, Hastings dragged September behind the car to give his friend shelter from any additional gunfire. Although his wounds were bad and would have been fatal for any human, September would survive given the right amount of time to heal. The healing properties of a guide were incredibly powerful, but slow in nature. September would not be helpful in any combat situations to come. Hastings measured the risk of leaving September alone outside. It would only take one headshot from Harp's sniper rifle to snuff out September's life force. Hastings surveyed the area. There were no places that appeared to be a safer location to hide his friend. But also, there wasn't an easy way for Harp to approach September without fully coming into view. With his friend positioned in what he calculated to be the safest place possible, Hastings drew the firearm from September's holster and placed it in his friend's left hand. The left arm maintained the functional shoulder, giving September the ability to fire the weapon should he need. Typically, September could fire the gun with the same level of accuracy from either hand, but the pain from the two bullet wounds would still be a distraction. Though not ideal, this placement would be the most survivable by Hastings' estimations. The Chronicler positioned September in what he thought would be the best vantage point should the assassin come out to finish the job. Hastings would have appreciated for September to give him a quick plan to execute, 
but the wounds that his friend had sustained were too serious for the guide to speak. September's breathing was raspy, and his eyes were closed more often than not. Knowing he would have to do this alone, Hastings gave September's good arm a tight squeeze. September, I know this would be an inappropriate time to tell you that my initial assessment was correct and the exchange was going to end with one of us being shot, so I'll save my speech for a more appropriate setting. I have determined a strategy for saving our friend, but it's going to involve me abandoning you here while I deal with Harp. If I make enough noise, I will most assuredly keep Harp from coming out here and shooting you in the face, which I'm sure she intends to do, given the chance. My plan is to take this tree branch and throw it through the picture window. This will cause a distraction where I will then burst through the cabin door with the element of surprise and shoot Harp. Now, I know what you're most likely thinking. This is a terrible plan. And normally I would agree with you, but if there are two stressed anomalies in that cabin, then any plan I make is most likely to be ruined anyway. At least this way, there's a chance that I can save you. And maybe the anomalies. And hopefully me. All right. That's all you're getting out of me at this point. Wish me good fortune in the events of his fit. Oh, almost forgot. September, your plan was awful, and I definitely told you so. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry, we were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right, ChumbaCasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary, full work limited by law, 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. At Baker's, shopping with pickup and delivery is the same as shopping in-store. Same low prices, deals, and rewards on the same high-quality items. It's one small click for groceries, one big win for busy families everywhere. Start your cart today at bakersplus.com. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Save big on your favorites with the buy five or more, save a dollar each sale. Simply buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with your card. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Inside, Emily watched as the green line intersected and then pulled the orange line further away from the cabin. The green line was decidedly Hastings, and the orange September. While she was worried for her friends, she felt a small sense of relief. Hastings would not be dragging September to safety if September had been killed. He was alive, for now at least. The room then erupted in chaos. Marcus rushed from her side and dove to tackle Harp. Harp was almost six feet tall and physically fit, while Marcus was at most five foot six inches with a smaller frame. The assassin had both the weight and size advantage, but Harp's crouched position, coupled with Marcus's element of surprise, allowed the smaller man to tackle the assassin into the wall and then knock her down. Harp let out a grunt as her head smashed into the wall. Emily wasted no time and rushed toward Harp's rifle. As she charged forward, Harp used her elbow to strike Marcus's nose. The blow sent Marcus backwards in a daze as blood immediately began to pour from his face. This gave Harp just enough freedom to push herself toward the rifle and grab its stock as Emily placed her own hands around the center of the weapon. If they had both been standing, Emily is certain that she would have lost this contest, but to her advantage... Harp still lay on the floor with arms outstretched at an odd angle. Emily's initial goal was to grab the rifle and turn it on the assassin. But the woman's grip on the gun was strong, 
and it took a large effort simply to rip the gun away. While she was successful, her attempt inadvertently flung the rifle across the room. Emily watched as the weapon bounced once and then slid under the couch where she had slept earlier this evening. Wisps of blue isfit lines pushed and guided the weapon out of reach, much to Emily's frustration. With the lower half of his face now covered in blood, Marcus steadied himself against the wall and stood up. He was still dizzy and twisting his neck in any direction created an intense pain in the back of his head, but he had to help Emily. His vision cleared just in time to see Harp grab Emily's left ankle and roll across the floor, twisting away from Marcus. The action reminded Marcus of a crocodile spinning after it captured its prey. In one swift move, the assassin had rolled Emily to the ground with a twisted leg and brought herself back up to her knees. Panicked, Marcus grabbed for the tube television with the intention of yanking it down on Harp. The old television was heavy and took slightly more effort to move than he had originally anticipated. This gave Harp the fraction of time she needed to dive from her crouch position into another roll. This time, when she regained her footing, she held a small glock that was previously holstered to her leg. Marcus hadn't even seen her draw the weapon. One second, the assassin was rolling away, and the next moment, her weapon was trained on him. He didn't even have time to be afraid before Harp pulled the trigger. Emily was in the process of rolling from her back to her front when the gun was fired. The bullet struck Marcus in the chest, and the man dropped. Instinctually, Emily's hand moved to cover her ears. The blast from the gun was deafening, and her ears began to ring almost immediately. With an effort, Emily chanced a glance at Harp and found that she had shifted her aim from Marcus to Emily. In torpified terror, Emily squeezed her eyes closed. A large crash came from the picture window, and glass sprayed everywhere. Emily drew her knees to her chest in an unintentional attempt to make herself small. Shattered glass lay on and around her body. After what she assumed was too much time, Emily realized that she had not been shot. She released the breath that she had been holding and reopened her eyes to find Harp with her weapon tracing back and forth from the picture window to the front door. Hastings was coming to help. Emily drew herself up and positioned herself in a way that allowed her to see the door Harp and Marcus all at the same time. Marcus's blue line was growing dim. In all the chaos, Emily had paid little attention to the lines, but now their significance rushed back to her. The green line that belonged to Hastings settled at the front door. The two blue lines that ran to Harp and Marcus were quite noticeably different now. Harp's line pulsed with energy, while Marcus's continued to dim. The pool of energy in Emily's Ispet Reservoir remained intact, even without her focusing on it. Emily watched the door handle twist slowly. Harp must have seen it as well because she stopped tracing back and forth and settled her aim on the door. Marcus's line flickered. With a surge of energy, Emily pulled at Harp's blue line with all her willpower and redirected that energy to Marcus. The cabin door began to open. Emily then forced some of her blue back toward Harp. She twisted it at the last moment, causing the Eastpit to pour into Harp's handgun. She could feel the chambered round begin to swell and warp. The barrel began to constrict. Emily pulled harder and harder at Harp's lines. The action took all of her strength, but drained Harp's Eastpit. She stole it all. She could feel the inside of the gun's chamber and sensed as the bullet casing degraded, the door opened and Harp fired. Harp's weapon exploded in her hand. The gun's slide split into several pieces, sending shrapnel from the weapon in multiple directions. The largest chunk of the slide struck Harp in the throat. The assassin brought her ruined hand to her neck as she unsuccessfully gasped for breath. Emily watched in horror as Harp fell first to her knees and then to the floor. The last bit of blue aspit flickered from the woman, and the line retreated into Emily's reservoir. With a last push of effort, Emily sent the blue from her chest and into Marcus, who still lay unconscious on the floor. She attempted to replicate the way she healed the man in her dream. Emily watched as Hastings cautiously entered through the door. 
Before the chronicler could reach her, Emily's vision went black and she fell unconscious. Emily, can you hear me? Emily. Uh, Are you certain she's not hurt? She might be hurt, but nothing too serious. I cannot tell without a more thorough assessment. I'm... I'm fine. Ah, you are awake. Good. You can help me carry bodies. Uh, I don't think I can. My leg hurts pretty bad. I'll, I'll try, though. Wait. Did you say bodies? Is Marcus... No. No, he is not dead. He's just unconscious. I can't seem to get him to wake up. Emily, are you okay? Besides the leg? I think so. My head is killing me and my ears are ringing, but I think I'm okay. We cannot stay here long. We have some time before the Contra will send a team to investigate, but we should not linger if we can avoid it. What happened? I was sort of hoping you could tell us. I opened the door and then Harp's weapon exploded. The shrapnel killed her and then you passed out. I checked you for notable injuries, but when I found none, I left you to check on Marcus and track September inside. Harp is dead. I placed her body behind the sofa. How was Marcus? He appears to have been healed. I can see where wounds were inflicted, but upon reviewing his body, there is only a scar there now. You appear to have more bruising than he does. No, I, I saw him get shot. How? How is that possible? We're not certain. Maybe as an anomaly, he has the ability to heal as well. Maybe Isfit simply healed him on its own. There are several theories that could explain it. No, I don't think so. He isn't an anomaly. He's a harbinger. I'm the only anomaly here, and... I think I healed him. Emily, there are no recorded cases of an anomaly healing someone. I think we should document a full recounting of your experience and attempt to determine what could have caused the healing. I am in no way saying that you are lying, but you have been through quite a bit of trauma and I could be naturally mistaken. In addition to that, I do not believe you have the capacity to heal at will. There are accounts in the Chronicler Annals that allude to the fact that Misfit can heal and is not always completely destructive. I am more inclined to believe such an event occurred. Hastings, I think it's time for us to take a step back and reassess our knowledge about the Chronicler Annals. Maybe they aren't as complete as you would like. Guys, I know what I saw. I pushed Harp's blue line into Marcus after he was shot. I didn't see him get healed, but I know I caused that. Just like I know I caused that weapon to explode. Emily, are you saying that you had a direct influence on the behavior of that weapon? Yeah, I think so. You intentionally caused that explosion? Definitely. Hastings, what do you make of that? I believe this would be the first documented example of an anomaly directly impacting an inanimate object such as a gun, as well as healing another life form, in this case, uh, Marcus. I will note that I do believe that she had a direct impact on the weapon. Oh? You're certain? Hmm. The statistical probability of a gun misfiring is incredibly low. Furthermore, the probability of a gun that belongs to someone like Harp, a well-trained assassin, is even lower. We would have kept this weapon well maintained. The ammunition would have been the correct type for the weapon and would have been checked before it was loaded into the clip. On top of that, a misfire that resulted in a structural rupture would be nearly impossible without an outside variant. I am leaning towards the conclusion that Emily is correct. She did have direct control over the outcome of these events. I'm trying really hard not to be offended that you both felt the need to talk through the entire scenario simply to determine what I just said happened. I'm sorry, Emily. It's not that we don't trust you. It's just that we've been doing this for over 400 years, and this is the first time we've heard anything like this. I, too, apologize, Emily. It's fine. To be fair, I haven't really trusted you two a whole lot over the last couple days. Oh, good. 
It is resolved, then. Okay, guys. Seriously, though, I would like to go home now. I agree. Help me carry Marcus, if you can. Emily Swanson is voiced by Tisha Zhang. Marcus Baker is voiced by Nico Rodriguez. Hastings is voiced by Adam Culbertson. September is voiced by Richard Collins. Harp is voiced by Stitch Mayo. Chronicler Rules, read by Seamus Rodriguez. And narrated by Michael Cole. Isfet Archives was written by Nico Rodriguez in collaboration with Tisha Zhang. Eastfit Archives is a creative typo entertainment production. Find out more about our show at www.creativetypo.com. Hey, I'm Tony Kinney. I'm the voice of Detective George Bullard, and I want to say thanks for listening. We really appreciate you. Uh, we hope you keep listening, and if you do, if you like what you've heard and you're going to keep listening feel free to drop us a review on your favorite podcatcher app or site. And you can also help support our shows on Patreon. Um, you can get access to binge all available episodes. You can get bonus content, ad free content. There's a few tiers on there. It's all kinds of good stuff. Got to give a special thank you to Nick Mead, our executive producer level patron. Uh, you can find out more about us and about our shows at creative typo.com. Thanks for listening. At Baker's, shopping with pickup and delivery is the same as shopping in-store. Same low prices, deals, and rewards on the same high-quality items. It's one small click for groceries, one big win for busy families everywhere. Start your cart today at bakersplus.com. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Save big on your favorites with the buy five or more, save a dollar each sale. Simply buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with your card. Baker's, fresh for everyone.